Well, in the Carolinas, you had been living with Gene Anderson, as we've discussed, and now you're just packing it up and moving to Florida. Are you like living out of a suitcase during this time? Pretty much. All your shit can just basically be fit into a car and you're on the road. Yep. Now, did Dusty hook you up with a new living situation or was that your responsibility? That was my responsibility. What did you do? Well, I was lucky. Uh, Jimmy Garvin was there. Mm. Uh, Jimmy Garvin's mother had a house and it had an apartment attached to it. So I was able to get that apartment. Hell yeah. So it made it pretty nice, man. That's really nice. Now, was was Garvin living with his mom? Uh, no. No. Oh, okay. He was just able to hook you up with some rent at her place. Well, he, he was he was living there too. Oh, the two of you were living there. Well, he was living in the in the house. I was living in the apartment. Gotcha. Okay. Wow. And uh Jimmy Garvin, I guess you had hooked up with him. It must have been mid south. Mid south, yeah. Cool. Okay. And uh, now you've got a good uh, living situation. Do you happen to remember? I know it's all these years later, so no big deal if you don't. Do you happen to remember what you're paying in rent to live somewhere like that back in those days? I remember, bro. I, kn- I know it's a tall ask, uh, but I don't know. It's like a little apartment attached to a house, maybe like 100 a month back in 82. Who knows? Uh, more than that. Oh, you think? Oh, God, yeah. I, it is Florida in the 80s, uh, which was a hell of a scene. Yeah, it's probably four or five hundred a month. Not so bad. Now, when you did talk to speaking of money, when you did talk to Dusty on the phone, what were there promises made as far as money or what they wanted to do with you or anything like that? Not as far as money goes, but okay. uh, I was going to be. I was told I was going to be given a shot at the top spot. You know, that's what I wanted to hear. That was enough for you, because uh, it's top spot. Presumably, means top money. Absolutely. Uh, I mentioned that you had worked in Florida briefly in 1975, and you had worked under the under the name Jake Smith Jr. at that time. Uh, what can you tell us about your first experience in that territory? Oh, it was a learning process, man. I was referee most of the time. Mm. You know, on the big shows, I would referee. On the small shows, I'd wrestle. How about that? So you're you're stepping in the ring with, I mean, were you in the ring with Dusty, like, reffing his matches? Yeah. Holy shit, like, you know, talk about a front row seat uh, for an opportunity to learn, right? Oh, yeah. Well, the, the man running the show down there, so to speak, is Eddie Graham. And he's considered one of the sharpest minds in terms of uh, the creative process in wrestling. And uh, a lot of his peers and competitors point to his brilliance and say that he was way, way ahead of his time. Could almost like kind of see the future of, the, of what uh, was going to happen in the business. Um, Jake, having worked on creative and professional wrestling yourself, what do you think made Eddie Graham so successful as a booker in pro wrestling? He... He took it apart, man, and put it back together. You know, he he, he made it a whole new thing. Mm. And he could write out, he could give you a match that would last 20 minutes and he, he'd have a, he'd have 15 minutes of moves in it. So <laughs> you had to fucking pay attention. <laughs> so he's he's laying out like entire matches? Yeah. Uh, you know, you and I actually discussed last episode that that's just not how things were done back in those days, but here's this old school promoter who's kind of forcing it on you. He just laid it out and you went out and did it, man. That's crazy, dude. Now, I, like, are you getting chewed out if you forget some of this shit? Cause it sounds like a lot. No, not really. Uh, how did you like, obviously he's a smart guy, so he kind of knows what the audience wanted, but again, you're used to calling the matches in the ring yourself and kind of having a little bit more control. Uh, how did you feel about the adjustment? It wasn't much of an adjustment for us because we get to do our own thing. Mm. And, uh, the, the bit we got was very, uh, very flexible. You know, we could take it and go a different direction if we wanted to. Okay. Do what we did, you know. But we were given just a shell and then, you know, given the finish, 
And that's that's basically what we had to hold to. Gotcha. So they'd give you essentially like bullet points and then you just get to improvise around it. Right. Okay. Well, uh, two men that learned from Eddie Graham, Kevin Sullivan and Dusty Rhodes, were both working in Florida when you came into the territory. Uh, both had made their impact on pro wrestling, uh, but they've done it in kind of different ways. Uh, what influence from Graham did you kind of see in both of these guys? Did you ever see any of that coming through in their work? Attention to detail. For the most part. Well, that's, that's a good one. Um was Eddie big on booking heat? Because I know that Kevin Sullivan was like a huge proponent of like heat, like building red hot heat. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was all about the heat. It's funny, man, because uh, you ask it just about anybody, you know, like uh, I, I want to say it's like the funks say that they learn from Eddie Graham and uh, like Watts learned from the funks. And it's like this kind of it's almost like a coaching tree. But a lot of it starts at, there in Florida with Eddie Graham. Yeah, he was a granddad, man. Well, as for you, here you are. You've just packed up and moved to Florida, and uh, you're working in a smaller territory. Um, you know, after having been in the Carolinas, which also included Virginia, did the size of the state and number of towns make it easier, do you think, for Graham to book wrestling or uh, more difficult in your estimation? I think it's more difficult. Yeah. Because he had so many overlaps. Uh So you're saying, like, because you're working a lot of the same towns over and over again, you've got to continually come up with new creative. Exactly. You couldn't go out and do the same shit. I mean, you've made this big move. Do you feel like because of this circumstance where it's a, a, a much smaller territory, do you feel like it's a long-term fit? Like, there's got to be a fairly short shelf life for a talent coming into a tiny territory, right? I knew it was going to be probably six to nine months. I mean, that's again, it's it, it's got to be a ton of pressure because you you're taking your your ass down to Florida. You're moving there. You're paying rent at, you know, Jimmy Garvin's place. And uh, you're like, hey, I have no idea how long I'm going to be here. Yep. What were you hoping to get out of the jump to Florida? Just more exposure More exposure, learn more, learn to work as a heel. And. Uh, pretty much it. Now, as you're doing this jumping from territory to territory, like once you get here and you're kind of settling in, are you starting to think about next moves or is it one of those things where it's like, okay, once it feels like the well is run dry, then I make my next move? Uh, that's how you do it. Okay. So you don't even start to think about where you're off to next. Oh, oh gosh. No. Um, Jake, that lifestyle going from territory to territory, one place to another, six months, eight months, however long, uh, frustrating or did you enjoy that lifestyle? It is a little frustrating, but I did enjoy it. You got to see a lot of the world. Yeah, you did. Uh, what can you tell us about the travel and work schedule when you came to CWF? What did the loop look like? Oh, the loop started with uh, Monday. And that was in uh, West Palm Beach. Tuesday was Tampa. Then Tuesday morning, you'd do television. I mean, Wednesday morning, you'd do television. And then Wednesday night, you'd be in Miami, which was 300 miles. Holy shit. One way. So you'd drive back that night. Thursday was Jacksonville, which was 225 miles one way. And then Friday would be a spot show around Tampa, maybe Fort Myers, or they'd send you to Tallahassee, which was 300 miles <laughs> one way. So you didn't know which, so you'd either be local or you'd be taking your ass 300 miles. That's right. A better payoff when you'd have to go all the way to Tallahassee? Nope. Oh, no. Brutal. Nope, it wasn't. So, I mean, smaller territory, but you're still doing a shitload of driving. Oh, yeah. Was Sunday a day off? No, Sunday was Orlando. Oh. So, you, did you have any days off? No. <laughs> you're working every single day. Yeah. 
Now, as far as payment is concerned, is, is it like end of the night? You go and stick your hand out to the promoter and he, he puts okay. cash in your hand? You got to check on Wednesday. Okay, once a week on Wednesday. Yeah. Better money than the Carolinas? Yeah. All right. So it had to feel like a nice upward movement for you then. I had a couple, you know, two or three hundred dollars more. Okay. Yeah, hey, good enough, man, especially in those days. Um, as I mentioned it, Florida in the early eighties, uh, man, it's a hell of a scene down there. That's like all the Miami vice vibes and you're seeing all of it from Tallahassee to Tampa to Miami. You are all over the map. You combine that with the fact that you're on TV down there. And I'm sure that there were plenty of good times to be had. Uh, I know you're working every day, but any outside of the ring stories stick out? Uh, it, it was a party scene for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, but, uh, we kept it. Tied up pretty tight. You know, we didn't go out too much strictly because you had to work the next night, you know? Yeah. So, uh, you might go out for a couple hours. That'd be about it. But I mean, when you went to, when you went to, uh, Miami, you were so friggin' tired. You'd already wrestled that day. And then you had to drive 300 miles and wrestle again. Oh, fuck, man. You had 300 miles back. <laughs> So it's not like you hung around in Miami and partied. Huh. Who has the energy to go out dancing after all that or whatever? Yeah, fuck it right, man. Yeah, there's no way. That, that would that would be tough, though, because it's like you are famous in the area. You're making decent money. Uh, you're on TV, and it's like, hey, I could probably go out and have a great time, meet some women, have some fun and party. But it's like, who the fuck has time? Nobody had the time or the energy, man. <laughs> Well, let's get into the wrestling portion of this. You'd make your debut in Florida on August 24th, 1982 in the Armory in Tampa, Florida, and you're wrestling a guy by the name of Tommy Wright. Uh, when you're working your first match in a new territory, Jake, are you out there looking to set the tone, knowing that the office is watching you closely, or do you just approach it approach it like business as usual? Well, for me, it was business as usual, man. I knew I wanted to be a heel, but I didn't want to go over the top with it, you know? Uh they had yet to disclose how I was tied in with Kevin or anything, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just went out and healed a match, you know? Just taking shortcuts, like the typical heel shit during the match. Uh, well, there might not be a ton, a ton to talk about Tommy, right? I don't imagine that you know the guy. His name didn't stick out to me. I remember him. Oh, okay, but not no like real personal interactions or anything of that sort. No, he had a great big head. A big head. <laughs> we called him Boxhead. <laughs> I'm sure he loved it. Oh, yeah. Could have turned into his gimmick. Oh, it makes a good target for that knee lift you were doing at the time, too, though. 